Welcome, everyone. You're listening to Access to Perspectives Conversation. My name is Dr. Joe Haverman, and I'm here with Dr. Mimi Zhou, who is a copywriter and supporting, supporting coaches and entrepreneurs. And I'm very happy to have you here as a guest today, Mimi. Welcome, and thanks for joining. Thank you so much for having me, Joe. I'm really excited to be here. It's a great pleasure. Um, uh, we we get to know we get to know each other in a networking um, community, where I also got to see some of your work with copywriting and helping entrepreneurs and coaches get their messaging right, which is also important in science communication, which is why. Um, in case some of the listeners might wonder um, what this conversation is going to be about, you also have uh, a PhD title. So you have, you have undergone a PhD program, which we're going to talk about. So, and the, 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 the angle that we're having this conversation with is around career building and career tra trajectories of what may happen after a PhD. To PhD program if you decide to leave academia and then turn entrepreneur and find build create and build your own business finding a purpose with your business supporting um, stakeholder groups of a certain kind so we'd very much like to hear from you what's your career path what made you um, what, what brought you to turn in certain route, into certain routes? What were the decision-making processes behind your career choices? And yeah, again, thanks for joining and we're um, all ears. Yeah, well, thanks again for having me. Um, that, that's a really big question. So, so let me dive in and you can ask me questions if things don't make sense. Um, yeah, so I finished a PhD in French literature at NYU at New York University, and I actually defended right before lockdown. So I defended in February 2020. Um, and prior to that, I like about about 18 months prior, when I was in the last stage of my dissertation, I started I really had to like decide, you know, am I going to continue down the academic path or or not? Um, and the thing, and and I really liked my research. My research was on the last um, or the the first stories of King Arthur's knights that were recorded in the Middle Ages by a person named Chrétien de Troyes. Mm. Um, so my research was on medieval French romance, and and I and and that was that was really fun. Um, but the thing that brought me out of that was that some years before, kind of kind of by chance, like I was in the right place at the right time, I had taken a personal finance class. And I, I, I had like the time on my hands to do it at the time. And I did it and I kind of did it and then like forgot about it. Um, I didn't forget the material, though. I remember that was really, it, it was like, I never thought really thought about I was I was 22 when I took it so so I never thought about like budgeting or like credit versus debit which is really important in the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, or investing or retirement and so I kind of just did this class and then went on my way <laughs> and it Wait, turned was, out was that before you started the PhD journey or in the middle of, of the same <laughs> It was before, it was actually, bef it was around the time when I was deciding what my next step would be. And I ended up deciding that would be a PhD, um, but it was before I even knew I was gonna do a PhD. Mm. Yeah, yeah, so so I went on and I, I did my PhD and it turned out that for living in New York City, it was really important to have all our grad student stipend. It was really important to know how to budget. <laughs> um, expensive city to live in, I hear. Yeah, it is. It is. And I one thing I realized though was that just looking around in New York, which is is quite liberal, um, even in New York, I didn't really see a lot of people talking about money. And I especially didn't see women talking about money. Mm. So as much as I liked my research, this I couldn't like shake this idea that like women don't 
talk about money enough. And it, it's just so important to have some financial education because women tend to live longer than men. So, you know, you kind of, you, you need to have like some understanding of, of finances and like how that will play out in your life. Um, anyway, so I decided to leave academia. And what I was going to do was start a, some kind of money coaching business for women. And, and as you know, Joe, I'm, that's not what I'm doing now. <laughs> and so I actually started down that path. I did a certificate in um, like financial, financial something or, or the other, I did a certificate, but, but I had only other studied literature. So I quickly realized that I didn't have as much expertise as I, I really needed to start that kind of business. Yeah. And I think I could have done it, but it would have taken me a long time. And meanwhile, once I entered the online business world, I realized that there really were a lot of coaches and creative service providers that need copy. And writing was a skill I already had. So I sort of, I did um, lessons on conversion copywriting, which is what I do now. And so, so I pivoted and I'm really happy with where I landed because now I help mostly female, mostly underrepresented entrepreneurs make more money by working on their marketing. Mm. Well, okay. Um, so is there, is there a specific group of female entrepreneurs that find your services or that you like working with and reach out to, to offer your services? Yeah, so, um, so, so I started by, it's, it's kind of shifted a little because these things shift as you work on them and you pivot and you make adjustments. I started by working with um, well, the, the idea was to work with women entrepreneurs who are coaches and creative service providers. So, so like leadership coaching or, um, like Maureen Archer was on your podcast and she was a professional, she is a professional English coach. Mm. Um, so coaches and creative service providers. So like web designers, um, like photographers, and so women in those kinds of positions. And right now I'm actually pivoting my, my messaging a little more to serve people who either feel or have felt underrepresented. And so I still work mostly in the niche of coaches and creative service providers. Um, but I actually feel that it, it became important to me to, so, so I know our listeners can't see this, but I, I am Chinese American. Um, and it became, as someone who has felt underrepresented in spaces like academia, it became important for me to, to explore this. And so right now I'm pivoting more towards people who have feel or have felt underrepresented, still keeping kind of the same services though in messaging and web copy. Mm. Um, since you mentioned your um, cultural heritage of being American, Chinese, but Chinese American, um, now with your with your phd research topic on medieval french literature um was there was there questioning why are you because of your asian background now in investigating european literature was that ever uh, a question or was it normal and never questioned by others i i'm asking this because i hear I work a lot with African scholars and it's very normal for Europeans or Western researchers to, to, uh, to conduct African studies of some sort, but the other way around seems pretty much um, like incomprehensible. When you have an African who studies American history or European history of some sort, or like, why shouldn't you focus on your own countries? Is that something you also experience? Yeah, that's a good question. I think I, what I would like to say is that I had a number of privileges on my path for sure. And I think that buffered my experience, not to say that there wasn't, you know, some of that, but 
Um, yeah, so, so this is just my perspective and I hope that listeners will, if it resonates, then, then I'm glad. And if it doesn't, they're welcome to, you know, leave it. <laughs> um, but I was, so I grew up in California and there's a large immigrant population in California. And so when I was younger, I think for a long time, I didn't actually realize I was really different or... <laughs> You know, I didn't really, I don't, I don't really stand out here. It'd be, it'd be very different. And I've heard very different experiences from people who are from Asia or, or from other places in like the American Midwest, for example, where the immigrant population is, can be much less. Um, um, yeah, so I started my studies at Berkeley as an undergrad. And I think I, I honestly didn't really feel like I stuck out until I studied abroad in Bordeaux in France, oh. which was an amazing experience. And, and I don't think I, I didn't stick out because I was Chinese American studying French literature, like the people at the universities I found are, were very, um, I don't think I got a lot of, I, I don't know, like questioning or stuff, but but living living in Bordeaux did make me realize like like oh there aren't a lot of immigrant populations everywhere <laughs> in the world um I I would get like calls on the street you know because yeah, yeah. Uh, so that was not as fun and then I think as I progressed in my graduate studies I didn't the questions are not overt. And I think that is kind of more difficult. Um, so, so very, very few people would say directly, like, why, why are you studying these topics? Like, I think that was not, I, I don't recall experiencing that so much, but the th stuff I, experienced as a grad student were more, I guess, what's now called microaggressions. Um, so I'll just give you a quick example. Uh -huh. Like, so at NYU, the French department was in this, it was in this building with six stories. You had to take the elevator up, um, which is really, it's totally normal in like lower Manhattan. And I think the East Asian language department was on the fifth story. I don't recall exactly anymore, but I would get onto the elevator and other people would get on the elevator mm -hmm. <laughs> and people would look at me and assume that I had pressed the button. They were going to the fifth floor and they would assume that I had pressed the button for that when it, in fact I hadn't. Mm -hmm. And so stuff like that would happen. Like there were little assumptions. Um, I did have a professor once say like, oh, you must translate from Chinese into English into French because she assumed that I, Chinese was my native language, which which I guess it it is. Although I'm not I'm not totally fluent anymore. Um, but but little things like that, like it was never overt. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that okay, and then what just um, from your soul. What, okay, now in this context or with this preceding question might come as now my question is exactly that, but I, I just want to also, because my research and my PhD was about evolution and the origin of animals. And I find this fascinating to be able to contribute to the knowledge or the proving of the animal tree of life from a molecular level. What was your fascination about the research topic that you chose for your PhD with medieval, medieval French literature? And then going to France, what was the, the wow moments? Yeah, so, so to be really honest, um, so I, when I was an undergrad, I did an honors thesis on one of the stories about Arthurian Nights. It was called The Story of the Grail or Le Conte du Graal. Um, and that was a completely stressful experience. <laughs> And I did it. I wrote my I wrote my honors thesis, and I was like, "Oh my goodness, I'm never going back to school." Um, and and the thing that happened was that actually, when I finished undergrad, my parents divorced, and that was a rough time. And during that same time, in part because I had just spent so much time with this one text, 
and having finished the honors thesis, I, I took like a two week break. And then I was like, oh, well, you know what? It was actually not that bad. <laughs> so I started reading, rereading and reading some of the stories, the other stories by Chrétien de Troyes, the other romances about Arthurian knights. Um, when I was going through this painful time and it was kind of, it was, it was such an interesting overlap because these knights are, you think they have it together because they go, they go on these like courageous journeys and they rescue the maidens, you know, all of that, blah, blah. but they don't, they don't, they make mistakes, you know, they make mistakes. Um, they, they really F up sometimes <laughs> and then they have to figure out how to correct those mistakes, which often they can't because the mistakes are made and there's no going back. And so it made for, it makes for an interesting story because it's not what you expect. And kind of being in this space of being kind of, um, you know, like sort of confused and like, okay, what's going on with my life? What's, what's, what's gonna happen? What am I gonna do? I felt like I was in good company with these knights who are also kind of in the same kind of headspace of like, I made a, I, I did something wrong and like, I don't know what to do and there's no right way and there's no clear way forward, which is the nature of um, the kind of adventure in medieval romance. It, it just, it, it refers to going out and seeing what happens. So I think, so, so that was really the moment. That was the moment. So in a way, did you feel seen in those narr narratives in, this, in the literature by, by those knights? So you, you, there was a, a level of identifying with the, yeah. But yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Well, that's so cool. I mean, it's it's interesting to learn how how each of us academics or researchers of some, for some time find find our ways to do a certain kind of research, and then what comes out of it, like what we find doing the research. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, sure. So what what were okay? Now you mentioned in the beginning that you. At some point, made a decision, and it was also a tough one, to leave academia. Um, as I want to set the stage, and maybe bursting a bubble here for many of our listeners, less than ten percent, like suddenly in the single digits of of PhD students, like whoever is currently doing a PhD program, brace yourself. Or for, but also it's a it's a great variety of options out there. This is basically the message we want to convey here of things to discover outside academia as career opportunities and there's only so many positions inside academia and whoever is willing to take on that journey um first of all good luck but also enjoy the right and in, a, in the best possible way because we need also these positions to be filled so <laughs> i'm like i'm not here to tell you of um we're we're just widening the horizon in the sense of there's many cool things to discover inside and also outside academia and so yeah and you made a decision to to go outside to to enter the entrepreneurial world um would you want to share with us how this decision came about in how it grew inside you and when you felt ready to take that step and also, what were the opportunities and challenges that presented themselves along the way? Yeah, sure. So I think at the very beginning, when I was first thinking of leaving academia, one thing I did, and which I really recommend people do if you're um, in a position in, in grad school or in a, in a you know, a, a, t a temporary position, perhaps, is I started following people who had gone on other career paths. So you can do that really easily on Twitter and, and I think on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, you can just, you can find so many academics who have left the academic field on Twitter. And so I followed a bunch of people who were, some people who were entrepreneurs who were in the personal finance space because that's what I was really interested in at the time. I followed some people who had gone on to admin positions because that is something that people do. Um, and I think there are, from, from what I see on Twitter, there are enjoyable aspects of that because you're still in the university. 
Um, you still have, if you want to do research, you have all the resources at your fingertips. Um, I talk to people in my field who had become independent scholars, you know, which is the title that you, at least in the US, you become, like I would be an independent scholar now if I published. Um, so I talked to people and I followed them on Twitter and they, people do all sorts, there are all sorts of positions, like people, you can work at a rare book library as a medievalist because we, we have training in manuscripts. Um, yeah, so the first thing I did was just to find what people were doing, what kinds of positions they were doing and followed them, followed along so that at least when, because... <laughs> I like I'm always scrolling Twitter anyway at least this way I kind of you know am productive and have a sense of keeping track of people's career paths mm -hmm. yeah yeah that's great also to show like I sometimes also show this in my courses for career building or career networking using LinkedIn if you just check the organizational page or the, the school page of your university and then check your connections there or you can also see where alumni of that university like Berkeley like one was yours or where you did your undergrads is that right yeah. um so you could check where people end up in what kind of positions from Berkeley like where alumni from Berkeley find then the professional positions to work in for their careers and that's like the magnitude is outside academia and you find all kinds of companies and um sectors non-profit for profit whatever business finance anything really so yeah it's it's a it's good to be aware of these opportunities and possibilities early on as in your career path so yeah thanks for pointing that out as an option so so when when it is idea grow in you to want to leave academia and maybe also briefly just touching briefly on the pros and cons for academia what did you experience as challenging and what were the things you maybe today miss from academia of anything yeah well I, I I do miss things I I sometimes so to be really honest with my kind of research because it was so um, it was so established. It was, it's, it's quite old. It's from the 1100s. It's also very canonical. So there's been a lot said. Um, so when I was writing my dissertation, I did sometimes feel that I had made up a problem so that I could answer the problem. <laughs> um, one of the things that brought me out of research was that the, the fact that women don't talk about money, that's like, a, that's a real problem. You know, I didn't make that up just so I could write a dissertation and get a degree. Um, but that said, I do miss my research sometimes. I miss because, and, and I guess I shouldn't speak for other people who have left academia, but I imagine I'm not the, I'm not alone in this. Um, just because I have a set of skills that not a lot of people have. So the ability to read old French, some knowledge of Latin and all of that old, that, that skill around dead languages, um, being able to look at manuscripts and having done some work on philology um, and, and some, some um, post-structural theory in my dissertation, which those are all like really obscure. <laughs> um, I, do, I do miss that, I miss, I miss sort of the, I, I mean, I miss looking at manuscripts. Manuscripts are beautiful. And that was really one of the highlights of my career was to be able to go to the, the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris to look at some of the originals. Mm. Um, and I miss being in an environment where people sort of speak that kind of language. Like if I talked to another medievalist and I said, like, I'm going to go look at this manuscript, that's, they, they, you, you understand that, you know, it's like you're part of the same family. Mm. So I do, there, there are definitely things that I miss. And you also mentioned to me in a prep call that you still keep ties and connection with your, was it your PhD advisor, your, you still have contacts, you occasionally reach out to from, from your PhD, the program 
um, various of friends and connections on LinkedIn that you keep having on your radar and sometimes you connect with? Yeah, yeah. And this is something I really want to say, because this is something I did. I wish someone had had told me this. I wish more people um, were vocal about this. But leaving, I think I had this fear before I left that I would just, it would just be like a, a door closed, you know, on my life. And it is, it is the end of a chapter. But I, I am still in touch with my dissertation advisor. Um, which has been really nice. It's, I mean, we're, we're not like, I don't say, I hope, um, Sarah, I should say, Sarah, if you ever listen to this, <laughs> I hope it's okay that I say these things. I don't, I wouldn't say we're best friends, but, but she visited, Cal she gave a talk at Berkeley recently and I'm in the area again. So I, I met up with her. She met my mom. <laughs> and so I went to see her talk on campus and it was amazing. It was, it was a beautiful talk. Um, and it's, I, I wish, I guess I wish I had known that people do, they finish, you can finish your PhD, you can go on and do something else because you want to prioritize maybe your quality of life, you know, like, or living like in California, I'm, I'm closer to my family. Um, you can do that and you can still stay in touch with your professors. It's, it's not like you, it's not like you disappear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's still the same yeah. world we all live in and yeah we can meet for coffee with whomever including people from a different sector now and exchange memories and experiences made since yeah that's beautiful i also reconnected with some of my phd connections um just last year yeah there was also fear involved because some of my right wasn't as was a bit bumpy <laughs> um so so there was also yeah fears to reconnect and it's, it's, it has to do with vulnerability and fears of being seen like 10 years ago where we all have grown since and yeah but then the experience was much better it's, it's also a matter of self-perception um so yeah it's it's nice to even even though i mean for me the 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 termination of my PhD was bumpy road, and mm -hmm. I, I mean, I was I ended on good terms, and yet there was these memories, and so I was a bit fearful of of reconnecting in the first place. But then it turned out really positive and nice, and also nice memories came after some time had passed. So, yeah, I, I can totally agree with you that also not. <laughs> like not to close the chapter fully but yes i think we maybe need to i don't know maybe some of us need a cut a hard cut to be able to move on to a new venue mm -hmm. and at the same time it's nice to keep some connections and to know you don't have to cut all ties with everyone like yeah yeah and and i want to add the end of my phd was also bumpy it was yeah um it, it was it was also bumpy and even though I felt fine about it mostly um because going into that stretch I knew I was very I knew at 80 percent I was not going to continue and when the pandemic hit I I felt like that door really closed um the the door to an academic career um what I guess I just want to say if the if you're if you're going through a bumpy time I just want you to know that that's that's normal just try you know like take one step at a time and and you do you do get to the end and the amazing thing about finishing is that once you defend you really become or I I have the sense that you become colleagues with your professors and so that's really quite nice um things like things do change is is i guess what i'm saying yeah and to the positive yeah. for sure well they can remain positive and they can become even more positive yeah 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 okay um so now in the entrepreneurial world um what were the what are the would, could you summarize key lessons learned what are if for, for some of the listeners who might consider to either 
skip even finishing. I mean, there's always a way to frame the PhD journey as a research assistant's time for, I mean, I also consider it at some point just to end it just before, like, like you just said, and then I pulled through nonetheless with all pains involved. And I also don't regret that, but it was quite a, quite a ride. Um, and also there's no shame in, in quitting and we don't have to call it that and yet we can so i mean these labels i mean i know that it's a it was attached to me with a lot of shame and that's maybe also one of the major reasons why why i decided to pull through but there was also times like the world will not end and it's an experience made nonetheless okay what am i trying to say here so no matter at what point you decide to enter or some of the listeners and decide to make a decision towards entrepreneurship um with or without the degree what are the things that are different um to consider that you as you said earlier that you wish somebody had told you that you found good and challenging and you know, something that you might have prepared yourself differently for if you knew yeah oh that's that's such a important question this is like what advice would I give myself like two to three years ago yeah, way to well <laughs> um I think that let, let's start with the good let's start with the good so one of the things I really struggled with as a grad student was my physical and mental health um I got uh, I guess what is what is um, acid reflux or GERD uh, very like routinely. And that always came for me with so much eczema. I would at one point, um, I had eczema all over, like the rashes would just spread all over my body. It was totally a stress reaction. And I got like prescription um, creams and stuff from the doctor. And I realized for me that antihistamines made it more manageable. So, so shout out to um, over-the-counter Claritin D <laughs> for helping me for helping me manage my eczema. Otherwise, it was it was so painful. Yeah, sometimes the most important support comes from an unexpected individuals, also or corners. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, since leaving academia, I haven't had eczema and I'm so grateful. So I know that for my body and probably, and, and my mental health, it was really the, the, it was the right thing for me. Um, I, I don't think academia would have been sustainable for me. And, um, one of the other good things about entrepreneurship is that you are, you have much more control over what you, what you do. Um, so one of my goals for entrepreneurship, because I do, my partner and I do want a family is that I can design a life where I have my career and I can also have a family, which even though I know steps have been made in academia towards this, um, the fact remains that if you're, if, if you're a woman who wants a family, you like your childbearing years overlap with usually the time you're either you're you're either trying to obtain the tenure track job or you're on the really stressful tenure track job. And I think that would have been extremely difficult for me, um, knowing what my goals are. Yeah, that's an important point also how to coordinate career and family life well, research career, academic careers and family life that's probably better organized than a nine to five job, which is not the same as being an entrepreneur, for sure. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you have more control, as you said, you can design your own work life balance. And yeah, okay. self control. Yeah, yeah. If you know what your goals are, then you can like one, one, I'm trying to build my business so that it works for my life. And I have the, and, and there might be things that are hard, you know? So, so let's, let's move on to some of the challenges. <laughs> so I've learned that entrepreneurship is not easy. I don't think it's as hard as academia for me personally. So every day, that I wake up and I come to my desk and I look at my tasks and I do them. I'm so grateful that this career path is not as difficult in my perception 
as the other career path. That makes a huge difference for me. Um, yeah. So, but that said, it is, it, it is still difficult. I think, um, one of the big mistakes I made that I've already shared was thinking that I could enter, like be, just become a money coach. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. I didn't have the background. So I think one really big piece of advice I have is that is for if listeners are considering entrepreneurship or just dipping a toe in, make like, look at your resume. If you don't have a resume, turn your CV into a resume <laughs> because that's a useful exercise. Oh my God, um, like seriously, can yeah. you quickly explain the difference? Because to me, those things were interchangeable. And I was always confused about why would some people call it resume at a CV, but there's an actual difference? Is it between tabular versus text, low text? Or? I don't actually know what the difference is. I'm probably not the expert to ask. I think a CV is all of your scholarly accomplishments. You know, that's why you have your publications and your conference presentations um, and and your education. I think that a resume is it focuses on your employment and skills and and um, and sort of metrics if you have them. So it's more. So so I guess I would say um, if you I, I remember when I was before I, I finished, I was working on putting together a resume with a career counselor at NYU. I had access to the services. So that's something that listeners can do. Like if you have a career center at your school, you can ha have help putting together a resume. And I really recommend that because you, they, this woman helped me identify my skills. So my skills were, were not money coaching. <laughs> they were public speaking because I had taught for a long time. I gave conference papers and I could, I'm comfortable speaking in public, um, writing and teaching. And I think those were the main ones. So, so long story short, I would, if you don't have a resume, try to think of what your skills are from your research and then see how you can monetize them because that would be your fastest path to cash, right? And there's no one way, there's no right answer. There's, there's plenty of ways you can monetize your skills, but I wish I had I wish I had been more cognizant because I did, I lost like a little bit of time going down the money coach route. Um, I don't regret it. Well, sometimes I, I regret it a little bit, <laughs> but, but overall I don't regret it. But um, yeah, I wish I had known. I think I would have been a bit more grounded and realistic if I had known that. Um, and then if you decide to go down the entrepreneurial route, I think having a plan for where the money is going to have come from. So either maybe you have savings or um, so I was, I, I want to say, and I think people don't say this enough. I wish people said this more. So I'm going to be very honest. I had some savings because again, I took a personal finance class when I was really young. So I knew the importance of savings uh -huh. um, and I live with my partner. So if I don't bring in anything, I know I'm not going to be out on the streets. I, I know what a huge privilege that is. And um, if you're not in this position, I, I, I guess I want to say I'm sorry. I don't, I don't really know what to say, but I wish more people were honest about their privileges because sometimes I do see in our space, Joe, like entrepreneurs who are, mm -hmm. they, you know, they, it looks like they made progress really fast, but, but then you found out like, oh, they did something 10 years ago because they were able to invest in that 10 years ago, you know? Um, so really they've been working for 10 years behind the scenes. And of course it's taken off. They've, they've worked at it for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Um, I wish people were more, a little more honest about their privileges and how they came by their successes, because I think very extremely few successes, if none, are truly overnight. Uh -huh. um, yeah, and then I would also say, I would advise people not to do it alone. Don't, you, you I think, I hate to say you can't, but I just wanna say that you, you can't do it alone. So, find like-minded people. Um, there are often, there are many groups where you can, you, you might pay some membership fee, but I've always found it's worth it. Mm -hmm. 
um, it doesn't have to be like a, like what we call a high ticket mastermind. You know, there are many, there are, there are different options. Um, yeah, find like-minded people because, because things will get hard. It's not a matter of if things get hard. It's a matter of when things get hard. I I feel it's the entrepreneurial journey is very similar to a PhD journey, just longer. (laughs) So if you think the PhD journey was a struggle, like praise yourself for entrepreneurship. And also there's many things that I've learned in academia and through the PhD journey that I can now adapt to my entrepreneurial journey. It doesn't make it easier, but I feel that I've already been through some struggles which now present themselves again and I know how to tackle them and yes support helps peer support helps I have like many people networking groups helps to know that we're not the only ones having these thoughts and doubts and how to get over and through them and how to take the next step that like we need we're social animals as human beings also entrepreneurs yeah yeah there was you had an episode about mental health um, a few episodes back and I I have to apologize I don't remember the name of the interviewer but she I really appreciated her discussion of mental health and one of the things she mentioned was the importance of community yeah yeah okay so now um, you're a copywriter um, service provider and copywriting you help coaches and entrepreneurs. For, for any of our listeners who find themselves in the entrepreneurial journey, so we will put your contact details um, into the show notes. Well, not the listeners ones, but maybe. Um, so um, to explore so your website, to, to check some of your works that you present on your website. And um, yeah, and I, I'm I'm just happy to have you on my network and um yeah I can only recommend your services to to anyone who feel they want to learn how to market themselves or to write their copy in a way that also captures the essence of what as entrepreneurs like also including myself like what we're here to present to our customers and clients and um to to frame that in a way that captures the messaging in a way that the service provider wants to express. And I mean, that's a skill in itself to have, which is why you're here to provide that service for those who have other services to present, to package those. Am I making sense at all? So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So what I do now is working on marketing messages. So defining what people want to say, which is really important. Um, And, and, and turning that into copy if people want. Um, And where I feel what what I really love doing is working with people who maybe have felt underrepresented before or feel underrepresented and taking the time to really pull apart all the nuances of who they are. So um, so I'm not just like rushing the job of getting the copy done. I think it's really important for people who feel underrepresented to take that time to, you know, really get to know all the aspects of who they are and then translate translating that into messaging and copy so they feel really seen by that which is which is part of what helps you market like you have to really love your marketing materials to put them out there yeah which also closes the circuit to why you hear what brought you on that journey to serve under like people who feel un, underrepresented in society will have something to offer to society to package it in a way that it's accessible. Thank you so much for sharing your journey with us today, um, Mimi, and I wish you all the best. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you so much for giving me the space to share parts of this, and I hope that listeners found it helpful. Um, My social media, my Twitter, and I think LinkedIn, I think will be in the show notes along with my Instagram. I am most active on Instagram these days, but if you if you find me and pop me a note saying that you <laughs> you listen to the podcast, you know I'll, I'll I'll I'd love to connect with you and and yeah yeah thank you so much for letting me giving me the space to share. It's a great pleasure. Thank you. Okay. See you again. <laughs>